we're starting recording right now. Okay, well, let's uh, let's open with prayer, okay? And we'll jump in so we don't get a Well, we're already late. We're always late. Um, let's, let's start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And as anybody knows from uh, the sermon that I just thought with, your, the word is sometimes really difficult to interpret. And uh, yet, at the same time, you ask us to listen, to apply, to apply ourselves to the text, to ask for the Holy Spirit's help, to ask for to look into other resources. And we 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 do all of that, Lord, with the anticipation that you're going to guide us and direct us into your truth. Mm. Not some um, theology that we bring to bear upon your word from outside, but we want your word to speak to us and to inform our theology, mm. rather than vice versa. So, Lord, we do that right now. We go into this text. We, we want to listen to you, we want to learn, we want to be exposed to it, and we want it to seep into our hearts and change us and inform us and make us those faithful witnesses yes. who call us to be. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Great I prayer. Pray. I on, of course, I preach on head coverings and veils and stuff like that in First Corinthians. <laughs> You're gonna have to check it out and see whether my whether my uh, exegesis was right on or not. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. I'll look forward to that. Okay. All right. Let's get cracking uh, with our first slide for the class, uh, which is class number 23, chapter nine. We're gonna finish up chapter nine, just that last verse. And as always, we do a very quick review of what we're gonna do. Uh, what we've done so that we can segue into the new material. So very, very quickly, uh, those first four trumpets that we had back in chapter eight uh, took up only six verses to cover the four first trumpets of the second judgment cycle. And then, uh, then we have in chapter nine, uh, the first two trumpets, five and six, and they take up the entire chapter. Chapter nine is 21 verses, and it, they took up the whole chapter. And those are, remember, uh, trumpet five and trumpet six are the first of the two, of three, first two of the, of the three woes. And let's remember how the uh, judgment cycles tend to pattern. The first four are, are more or less about warfare and that kind of thing here with the trumpets, uh, it's on the earth, but it's indirectly for the ungodly. But then the, the last three with the seals and here with the trumpet, uh, they're directly unleashed and, and it's un, almost unmitigated against and directly against the ungodly. And so that's where we were. And we did cover verse 20, but uh, 20 and 21 are so similar and 20 leads well into 21. So I'd like to start off and have Betty uh, reading 9, 20 for us to review uh, before we get into the new chapter. Revelations 9, 20. The rest of humankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Yeah, great, great reading, Betty. Good, good job. Now notice that we focused last week. Uh, there's a lot here uh, on the works of their hands. Uh, of what they didn't repent of, the works of their hands, and then it's outlined in the rest of the verse. Back in those days, uh, creating and, and crafting uh, religious statues became an art form. I mean, there's plenty of evidence in the New Testament that they literally worshiped idols, uh, the, the conventional sense of an idol uh, that were the works of a person's hands. But then remember that we talked about, well, how does this apply to us today? We don't see many people worshiping idols in our day in that way, but they certainly do in other ways. And 
at the base of it, we learned that idolatry has to do with covet covetousness. In fact, Paul links the two directly in Ephesians. If you want to read Ephesians sometime, he said, covetousness is idolatry. So whatever we love, that's our God. So if we love things more than we love our Lord, then we got some work to do. And here we're seeing in verse 21, the same thing that was said in 2020 uh, that I didn't mention, but let's have Dennis read 21, where the phrase of what, they, what the ungodly did not do comes out at us again. In Revelation 9, 21, and they did not repent of their murders or sorceries or their fornication or their thefts. Excellent. Excellent. We had that in the in verse 20 as well. So it's a it's a little astounding if you think about it. Despite a third of humankind massacred by by this demonic ca cavalry. Uh, so you have two thirds that are still alive, and yet they continue to defy their creator and continue to worship the very malignant forces that are bringing about their own destruction. And so it's pretty amazing that they still wouldn't repent e despite all of this. And that's an important point that we don't want to miss with the judgment cycles. They're redemptive. Let's never forget they're meant to bring people back and to return to, to their creator. It's not to punish them per se, uh, just for being bad people. It's to try to get them to reprove and reform their ways. Now, the, the verse that Dennis just read gives us uh, the three out of the four vices that are already uh, cataloged in the Ten Commandments. Three out of the four vices that are listed there, murder, uh, immorality, sorcery, and theft. And the New Testament does the same thing. The, two, the New Testament, now the order might be different, but these same vices are listed in different passages in the New Testament as no knows as well. And in fact, uh, just for as one example, in Galatians 5, Paul lists sorcery as one of the works of the flesh. But probably most importantly for us today is to see with sorcery there, pharmakeia, is the Greek word for it? Uh, no, not pharmaceuticals per se. But uh, Later in chapter eight of Revelation, we learn that the sorcery used by Babylon, the harlot, in, in this case, Rome, was the key method they used to deceive the people. Now, whether that was intentional or unintentional is really beside the point. Uh, superpowers throughout church history, throughout salvation history, whether they're aware of it or not, they're under the influence, those that are corrupt and uh, are idolatrous and they're not serving the living God, are under the power of the evil one, whether they know it or not, whether they think so or not, or whether they want to or not, they're under the power of the unholy spirit. Now, I'm going to give, provide a near contemporary example of this with an unlikely person that I think many of you know. It's a famous female scientist. Anyone know this Polish woman that's on the le left there? Does anyone know who that so female scientist of uh, the turn of the 20th century is? Marie Curie. Excellent. Madame Curie. Yeah. Okay. Two gold stars, uh, Daniel and Betty. Yes, it's, it's Madame Curie. And anybody know what she uh, had discovered on the periodic table? No. And she didn't get much credit for it being a woman, but she's the one that discovered this element. Radiation. Oh. Yeah, radiation. Okay, so why am I bringing her up? <laughs> You're not going to believe this. 
I'll give you the very, very, very short story of Madame Curie. She grew up in a household in Poland uh, with a father who was a professor at a prestigious university. Well, World War, uh, World War I, yeah, I think it was World War I came along and ruined all their plans. But he, he groomed and, and trained and educated his children to be uh, critical thinkers, et cetera, et cetera. And as time went on and the war came on, et cetera, more and more, she was more and more uh, disillusioned by the church. And she, she ultimately, when she went, went great, to greater and greater heights in her scientific achievements, she renounced her faith. So she was functionally an atheist, you could say, at, at uh, some point. Then she goes into this prestigious society in Paris and she's among all of the scientific geniuses of her day. And she's, uh, she's discovering all kinds, of si all kinds of scientific breakthroughs that uh, other men in France were getting credit for and she wasn't. But the story isn't about her, about that. It's about how it connects to 921. Okay, she renounces her faith and she hobnobs and finds herself uh, in the community of intelligentsia of, of that day. And look at the image on your right. What is? What do you think that's a depiction of? Almost Anybody? Like, almost looks like a seance. It is a great pastor. That's exactly right. what it is. Really, right. Ma Madame Curie substituted, exchanged faith in the living God for seances where she and her scientific colleagues, the smartest people in Western Europe, arguably the smartest people in Western Europe at the time or among them, exchanged belief in the living God who created them and gave them the opportunity to discover more riches about uh, the world for demonic seances where they're trying i don't i am not exaggerating these people went to these sciences on a regular basis to try to talk to the dead to get secrets out of them about the other world now if that isn't delusion i don't know what is <laughs> anyway on on that note we end 921 it hey, just shows you it's got nothing to do with IQ. Chris, I wanted to ask a question um, about the worship vitals uh, because Stephanie has these remarkable uh, images up there for us. And one of them has this guy with his hands like praying. It's says, stay yeah. woke, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I'm wondering, you know, the worship of ideologies, uh, not just, you know, you know uh, sorcery and stuff like that, but ideologies that are false, that are driving people in a different, in a way, uh, completely away from God, and yeah. and they're destructive. So I'm just wondering, you know, about that, and as we try to hermeneutically uh, look at this and, and bring it into our present culture, uh, with that, I mean that that image that uh, that Stephanie had there was like I thought right on. Stay woke, you know. Absolutely. Um, Right, you're you're absolutely right because it's. I love how Augustine put it. He said, "I'm going to paraphrase him because I don't want to get the exact quote wrong." But he literally was saying, "In everyone, there is an emptiness. There's a hole in us that only God can fill." So yes. when we remove God, we notice how nature hates a vacuum. Yeah. Well, the thing that, uh, that uh, a corollary of this would be the study of history. When you study history, you see cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect. Well, things don't happen unless something, it changes or it needs change. Even, even history doesn't like a vacuum. Nature doesn't like it. History doesn't like it. Hum We're not wired to be empty spiritually. And so if you remove God, like we've been systematically been, been doing that in the public square, 
and in, in school and, and everywhere else, you're going to re you're, whether you think you will or not, you're ultimately going to replace it with something else. And that's the, that's the, one of the greatest tools uh, the, the evil one uses. And a great book to read along those lines would be by C.S. Lewis, and they're called Letters. But they're not the letters to the seven churches. It's called the Screw Tape Letters. Yeah. And th there we get uh, C.S. Lewis at his most devious, trying to think like a demon thinks. <laughs> and showing you all the wiles of the underworld. So, you know, that's a really important point for us to touch base and touch down on how it applies in our own day is yes, it, there's a vacuum there in spiritual vacuum that's been there for a long time. I and mean, remember in the 60s, uh, this was going to be the new age where we had this experimentation with psychedelic drugs, et cetera, and that would get us to a new horizon. Well, look what that did. <laughs> Age of Aquarius. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now it's, it, and oh, notice how it just keeps increasing. It just keeps kind of going to a further, further edge yeah. with okay. greater consequences uh, attached to them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an important thing to, to note. All right, let's move to. We could just keep talking about that, but let's move to a very, very brief review before we jump into this incredibly important chapter 10 uh, that leads into another important chapter 11, which 10 and 11 are going to really be pivotal for the entire rest of the book. Because if we get 10 and 11 right, we're, it's going to be smooth sailing for the rest of the book. Oh, uh, you, oh. Yeah, the heavy, lift, the heavy lifting will be over after 11. Uh. So, uh, let, but, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it should be, <laughs> it should be, but before we, let's not rush this, but before we move into 10, let's just, any highlights, any, any noteworthy things that come to mind out of chapter nine uh, that you would like to comment on or want to uh, ask about or explicate uh, something before we move into 10. Because remember, we're, we're leaving off kind of like we did with the first cycle of judgments with the seals, the sixth in the cycle. And then we're gonna, you think we're gonna get to the seventh and, and, and all Hades is gonna break out like the, 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 the locust from the pit of, of the abyss? No, we don't see the seventh trumpet for, for uh, one and a half chapters. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to get a big interlude, a bigger one than the with the seals judgment. Uh, but what did you make of chapter nine? And for that matter, I guess, no, no, chapter nine, because eight, we've already covered in review. Well, nine was action packed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure was. There's, sure was. There's just so much. Right. Now, 21 verses for two woes or two trumpets as compared to six verses for four trumpets, the first four. But remember the last three, the magnitude just is exponential. So that's why so much is being said. For the, for the fifth was the torment and the sixth was, was death. The fifth, they wanted uh, to die, but couldn't. And the sixth torment, uh, they did die. A third did rather than a quarter. So the ante had been upped. But let's, let's remember something on a positive note. And that is the stark contrast of those two smokes. Remember the smoke that arises from the, uh, the abyss, darkens and blackens the sky with this sinister color. And what comes out of it are, are these demonic beasts, winged creatures that have uh, scorpion-like tails. Okay, so that's a smoke no one wants. Compare that or contrast that with the other smoke, the smoke of the incense of the prayers of the saints that arise to God. And rather than be part of a stench and, and filth and sulfur and brimstone, it arises to God as a sweet incense and fragrance upon which he acts and responds. So we're seeing both at work here in chapter nine, even though it seems it's all about 
the uh, all about the uh, the divine judgments. It's really in contrast to uh, the redemptive work and the ongoing salvation history that's undergirding everything. Anybody else have uh, something you'd like to share before we move to 10? Yeah, I was just sitting here thinking, Chris, um, these were apocalyptic events. Is yeah. That correct? And yes. so is it correct to also uh, identify them as supernatural events? Well, how would you they, differentiate they, between apocalyptic yeah. and supernatural? That's a tricky one. Uh, I don't think the answer to that is an either or. I don't think it is because we've already seen, see, see how foundational the seven messages to the uh, churches in Asia Minor were? It's because we saw elements of both of that in chapter two and three. It looks like it's apocalyptic, et cetera. And, yet, and it had the language of final days, great tribulation and all. In fact, he even says that. You're going to die. You're going to be martyred. You might be martyred etc. And yet, uh, there wasn't what we would consider this otherworldly type of stuff going on. It, it, it could be supernatural, uh, especially in that last generation, but it's going to be largely, as we've seen through church history, beginning with Christ uh, coming, the first coming of Christ, up to the second coming and everything in between. It's been, so far, it's been largely natural. What, what is being described in apocalyptic terms has been largely natural, uh, using uh, the heavens uh, and uh, nature, et cetera, and people against each other. Remember the apocalyptic horsemen, the four? That, that's easily, uh, you could easily interpret that exclusively as mankind beating up on mankind uh, warring against each other, killing one another, and God's allowing it uh, because of the evil of their hearts. I mean, I, I would not chalk up World War II to the gift of the Holy Spirit to the human race. <laughs> no. no. So you're asking a really good question. Uh, and let's, let's touch down at different places. Let's remember that question and let's touch down at different places and see if we can have both. I think there's probably gonna be both, but I would, I would err on the side of caution of trying to supernaturalize everything since we haven't really seen it in 2000 years yet, right? I mean, it might have been there. I mean, it's there on the spiritual realm yeah. because God's behind all these things. So on that level, it is supernatural. But I think you're looking for something more than that, I thought. Yeah. But anyway, that's a great question. Anybody else want to share? All right. In that case, we got 18 minutes till the break. So let's uh, sally ho and go forth into chapter. We have a new slide that starts 10. It's chapter 10, same class. But notice at the top there. This is the chapter of the angel with the scroll. All righty. So let's have Rachel, who is among us, read verse one for us. Okay. Revelation 10, 1. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. Mm -hmm. That's right out of your song, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rachel's done, done a video that's pretty cool that has that as its title, Pillars of Fire. It's pretty cool yeah. stuff. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for reading that. That's great. Um, and here we have a scene that's completely changed from this unrelenting disaster that has just occurred in the previous chapter. Now, again, let's remind ourselves that there's no such thing as chapter and verses in John's day. So what they saw and what they heard, the Asian minor churches that are hearing this, 
in 921 immediately is followed by, and I saw another mighty angel. Remember, that's an audio, auditory marker of a change in vision. And notice that the, the tone and the temperature and atmosphere is dramatically changed here. Because now we're seeing uh, what is clearly another interlude. Because what we would have expected here is what? The seventh trumpet. And we would have expected uh, even more unmitigated disaster than we saw with the sixth trumpet with a third of the world being nailed. So at the outset of this interlude, John sees an angel, but not just any angel, a mighty angel. And not just a mighty angel, because there's been one other of that, but in his descriptions of this heavenly angel, they're bountiful. He's wrapped in a cloud, rainbow on his head, face like the sun, legs of pillar. That's a lot. So that must mean that this angel is pretty important. In fact, so important that a plethora of descriptions for this angel is far more elaborate than that of every other angel in the entire book of Revelation. It's here. It's this angel. So this suggests, as far as angels go in Revelation, that is, this angel is uniquely important in Revelation. So let's consider the images and see what they most likely symbolize. Clouds often accompany the coming of God. And here is yet another reference to Daniel 7 with a divine being coming in clouds of glory. Remember that all the synoptic gospels have a divine visitation with clouds when Jesus is transfigured. Remember that, those scenes yeah, in all three, right. Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Right. Ancient yeah. readers would have viewed the rainbow as a halo, another sign of glory. And remember, and this is important, Remember the rainbow around the divine throne as a description of God in chapter four right. Right. in the Theophany chapter? Yeah. And we're not done. A sun-like face, a sun-like face. Wait a minute, that, that sounds like Christ back in chapter one. We're not done. Legs as pillars of fire. Now, this may well allude to the Exodus. Remember when God protected and guided the people with the fire by night, pillars of fire by night and clouds by day uh, to get them out of Egypt to yeah. uh, traverse to the promised land. So that's a lot. Now, because it's so much here, some interpreters see this figure as Christ. But that can't be the case, not least because... Not once, but twice, John attempts to worship an angel in Revelation. And in both instances, the angel commands him emphatically, worship only God. Now, if you haven't caught it by now, now's the time to catch it and then ver have it verified as we go through the chapters to follow. John is incredibly careful and precise in his language about the Godhead, about the Father, Son, and Spirit, and the clear order of the hierarchy of their authority and power over everything else. So no, this is not a reference to Christ. Yet, all of this splendor and buildup about this mighty angel who descends from heaven, that's one quarter, of, of all of the universe and strides over both land and sea over, that's all three. It's meant to have great significance. His exalted appearance is most likely because he's mediating divine revelation. So let's have Edward help us out and see if this is the case in verse two. Okay, Revelation 10, 2. He held a little scroll open in his hand, seeing his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. 
great, great reading. Okay, notice in, in parentheses, I've got the word little, and I put it in parentheses, not because <laughs> the NRSV does that with it, or the NIV that does that with it, but because people have been confused and interpreters have been confused by uh, this Greek word for the scroll here in 10.2. This same scroll is pictured in Revelation chapter five, where it first appears on the scene in the vision there, the Christophany vision, and in chapter 10 here, using synonyms for the Greek word biblion, and here the diminutive form bibliaridon, respectively. They're interchangeable in this very chapter, chapter 10. Here in verse one, we have the diminutive form. And in verse eight, if you jump ahead, and if you have your Bible in front of you, you'll notice that there's no adjective little in front of scroll there, because it's the exact same word, Greek word, exact same word for the same scroll and word given to us initially for the first time in chapter five. Yes, that's right. The one and the same scroll are talked about here is the one that the slaughtered lamb unsealed so that this mighty angel could now give this now open scroll to John. This in all likelihood is the same angel that was commissioned to share the revelation of Christ with John stated way back in chapter one, verse one. And let's have Edward Re re refresh our memory, oh, Doug, I'm sorry, Doug, and we're just read. Let's have Doug read uh, that passage in 1-1. One, one. Revelation, is that 1-1? One, one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave through him to show the servants uh, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Amen. Good reading, great reading. All right, let's keep that up for a minute and see what's highlighted. Notice the chain of authority, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, we know that. The apocalypse, the unveiling of Christ. Well, wait a minute. Which God, God the Father, gave him. Who? Jesus. Yeah. Which God gave Christ to show his servants, what must, now look at that other phrase there, because that's going to come up a couple of verses from now, with, uh, the verse that says, and time, uh, time will not be delayed, which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to a specific servant, a prophet, and his name is John. So that's what we've got going on here. And the content of the now open scroll as disclosed in summary form is going to come at us in chapter 11. And it's going to be further elaborated in chapters 12 and following. So I think you're going to begin to see why 10 and 11 are so critical for the rest of Revelation. Now, portraying this, the importance of this mighty angel's mission by granting him this great authority, coming down from having, having a foot on land and a foot on, on, the, on uh, the sea, further confirms his divine uh, authoritative um, power uh, to be that mediator. So let's have uh, Deborah Wright, who's doing a great stand-in for Don uh, the Andrus, uh, read this next verse for us. Revelation 10.3. He gave a great shout like a lion roaring. And when he shouted, the seven thunders sounded. Okay, great. Now on first impression, we, th we think, oh no, here we go again. <laughs> but the mighty angel's voice appears threatening. It does for, th for two, at least two reasons. One, it's a great shout and Along with that, it's a great shout of a roaring lion. And two, it's responded to by elementary, elementary fury. 
the seven thunders, also a menacing image. The seven thunders have been interpreted in at least two big ways. The majority uh, opinions on this boil down to about two. Either the thunders are God's voice or they're a group of heavenly powers. Now, although some Old Testament texts do compare God's voice to thunder at times, in this verse, the thunders speak with their own voices and equally important, a little bit later in the chapter, it will be God's own voice from his throne that is going to tell John not to write down the cries of these seven thunders. So it's very unlikely that this is God's voice here. And it's God's the one uh, about imminent to about to set us off with another set of judgments. So let's uh, go to our next so slide for verse four. And let's have Brownie, who's with us, read this one. Morning, everyone. Morning. Revelation 10.4. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Great, great, great reading. Excellent. Okay, while we have that up, I want you to note the dramatic reversal of what we should have expected here. They sounded, and he's about to write yet what would seem to be yet another set of judgment cycles in the middle of the trumpets. Because remember, we're not done with the trumpets yet. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal it up, what they've said, and do not write it down. All right, so boy, what's the deal here? Now, let's keep in mind here that this is a very important uh, point because here, they're commanded not to write it down, and it's saying it twice in the same verse using synonymous parallelism. Seal it up is the first. The other way of saying it is don't write it down. Now, whenever you have some synonymous parallelism, it's for emphasis. So this is an, an incredibly important point. And of course, this raises the obvious question. Why not write it down? <laughs> Why not? Here we have an echo of our old friend, Danny. Danny from the Old Testament. Yep. It's the same stuff, but significantly different. He loves to follow the, uh, the Old Testament prophet, and then he'll alter or expand. Here we've got Dan 8, Daniel 8, and chap Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 12, where Daniel's commanded to seal up the vision and the book sealed, but only temporarily. The, re the revelation he's received as described in chapters eight and 12 must remain hidden until the time of the end. So let's have Pastor John read that excerpt out of Danny for us. <laughs> Danny 12, four, eight and nine. But you, Daniel, Keep the word secret and the book sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be running back and forth and evil shall increase. I, Daniel said, my Lord, what shall the outcome, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel. The words are to remain secret and sealed until the time of the end. Excellent. Excellent reading. Okay, let's stay there for a minute. See what's highlighted? In fact, Pastor, you did such a good job. Would you uh, read those highlights? Secret, sealed, secret, and sealed. Look at that. All in, all in that very tight passage there. So now we have something of an answer, or do we? <laughs> well, here, let, let's jump back to Revelation 10. Here in Revelation, we have John commanded not just not to, but never to write it down or to reveal at any time what the seven thunders have uttered. 
So this command to seal up what John now hears, the seven thunders say right here, with the seven, six trumpets unleashed and having zero impact in moving the ungodly towards repentance, it indicates something. It indicates that yet another set of judgments is going to just have the same outcome, unrepentance and further defiance. In other words, God's will here is clear. He's going to intervene. He's going to interrupt the movement towards ever-increasing, devastating judgments. And in his mercy, he's commanding that the threats of the seven thunders not be carried out. Now, what's the basis for arriving at this conclusion from the verses that follow? Let's note well in verse 5 and all the way up to the end of chapter 10 and all the way up to near the end of chapter 11 that there are no thunder judgments and no seventh climactic trumpet judgment unleashed upon humankind. They're gone. They're gone and disappeared. Poof. And replaced with this interlude of a very different nature than anyone would have expected unless it had been divinely revealed. Now we're at what is called the caffeinational respite. Okay, got to go get some caffeine there. And how is Arby doing? Arby, uh, he likes his coffee cold. Does he? <laughs> okay. Does he like it iced? <laughs> yeah. He what he wants a he wants a carrot like flavor in the ice, and that's hard to do. A carrot latte. <laughs> Starbucks will come out with that at some point. So what are what are we two three minutes or more? Yeah, three four minutes. Okay. Sounds quick, good. Quick, 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 quick. Okay, quick. sounds good. Coffee warm up time, Doug. Coffee warm up time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to go. I can't little. tell you. I can you yeah. I was going to do something with my head or face, and I didn't do it. I was like, I can't. Yeah. It's coming out. Oh, it's coming out. Hi, Bronnie. Hi, Bronnie. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm hanging in. <laughs> good. Good. Betty, how are you? Marsha's here and um, she's talking to Toby. So uh, all is good. <laughs> Well, have Marcia show you her red shoes. Unless oh, I know she it. Yes, red shoes. I know I should have got that half up for my red shoes. Some goodies out there. See your white lips so you can get away with it. I know. Well, we will we'll never know. tell either. As long as not. Betty, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing okay. I'll I'll tell you why I wasn't in church later. I don't want to go into it now. Okay, but we missed you. My yeah. blood pressure has been all over the place. Oh, so. okay. We missed you. Thank you. Fun. I miss being there. And and I'm sorry, I never got it to come through to my phone. It, it was oh, just grinding away and I never saw. So I'm hoping that, that the uh, replay will be there. Yeah, I believe it got recorded. But I'm not, I can't speak to the quality yet. Yeah, evidently it got recorded and um, it'll be up later on. Guy is going to upload it and 
They'll be up this afternoon. Okay. We ran into buffering. Okay, good. Dennis was there for that. It was buffering and doing yes. all that stuff. Yeah. All I saw was uh, something about announcements and it just kept showing that, but it never showed any of the announcements and it never got to the to the church, uh, the actual service. So yeah. I hope to see it later today. Yeah, Dennis was saying the internet and froze up on us. You know how um, late Dawn's having the girls and our um, Luke and Emily coming to get them, or are you guys taking them? She wasn't even sure this morning whether they were coming to get them or she was, she was taking them back to Luke and him. So. Okay. She was hoping <clears throat> that they'd come. But I'm, I was just wondering because I'm going to have my granddaughters and I think there's time I'm going to get them over it so the girls can try and play together. Yeah, I saw the. Uh, a little kid stuff out on the field out front. Is that where you expect me? No. Oh, I don't know what it looked that like was. a little bag. I'm going to start the kids. Can you? Oh, maybe it got left there. Okay. I don't know. It was in the, in the not next Oh, the yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I think we just have stuff ready. And just, oh, okay. Just, I, I, yeah. I thought you were ready. No, yeah. I didn't. No, I'm, no, I'm not getting uh, mine until after church. It's kind of oh, okay. Because I, I have to stay, I have to stay and make sure this gets uploaded. She said the part I do have to stay for is when I go and put it on YouTube, I have to wait until it gets completely uploaded. Convert with. Convert. Well, the converting just happens oh, right okay. after that, but then after it's converted, then I have to upload it onto YouTube. Yeah. All right, I think we're ready. Right? No, well, we're waiting on Wendy. And is that it then? That's We're it. a small group today, huh? Hold on, Rob, are here. Right. Skinny today. This is Thomas. You might want to unmute him. Oops. Hello. 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 I'm mute, Chris. Oh, I don't know why it, it muted on me. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, Pastor John, you'll be happy to know I finally have got my sister Connie to, who's been watching these through the links. She, she and her husband can't uh, attend on Sunday live, but they've been faithfully watching them, and she's going to try and join on Wednesday. Oh, cool! That'd yeah, that would be great. Yeah, and awesome. All the way from Massachusetts, the frozen tundra. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That'll be really great to see her. Yeah, yeah, it'll be great. I haven't seen her in years. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen her, so that'll be even more unique. Yeah, she, she and her husband are really enjoying this, which is surprising me uh, big time. <laughs> but it's great. I'm loving it. Well, that is awesome, yeah. All right, we're ready again. Okay. Sally Ho, as you would say, Sally Ho. Uh, Sally Ho, okay, Daniel and Raquel aren't back, Edward, okay, we'll get cracking and then uh, they'll catch it later if, if need be. Okay, let's uh, have, uh, oh, wait a minute, we're gonna have, <laughs> gotta find some other. Okay, Raquel's back. Uh, you need, you're gonna need to unmute to uh, do verse five for us, Raquel, if you don't mind. There we go. Okay, Revelation 10, 5. <clears throat> then the angel, excuse me. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and the land raised his right hand to heaven. 
Great reading. Excellent job. Yeah, so this mighty angel that uh, ex uh, stretches over the heaven that he came from and sea and land, all three quarters of the universe, he swears by the one that can only guarantee any oath. Raising of the right hand to heaven sy symbolizes in the Old Testament and Jewish uh, tradition, the guarantee of an oath. And again, this goes back to Danny, where in chapter 12, the angel before Daniel also raises his right hand, swearing an oath towards heaven. So this is going to help uh, build the momentum, suspense, and significance of what is going on in this open now open scroll. And the content of the angel's solemn oath to God is now going to be revealed to us in verse 6. And let's have uh, Ginny read verse 6 for us, if she would. Revelation 10, 6. And swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it. There will be no more delay. Excellent. Great reading. Notice what's highlighted there. He swears by the one who is immortal and by the one who created everything and announcing that there will be no more delay. So the angel swearing by the one who sits on the throne obviously symbolizes that this is the ultimate assurance of what is promised is certainly going to transpire. Because as John certainly knows, and any good Orthodox Jew knows, there is no higher authority than God himself. Now, let's note that this mighty angel underscores the legitimacy of his oath, that there will be no more delay, by identifying God as both the everlasting one and the one who created everything that exists. So the buildup here is warranted when we hear what God commands. What does he command? There will be no more delay. I really like how the punctuation here of the NIV does it with the exclamation point rather than the NRSV that simply has a very anticlimactic comma here. I think the exclamation, now there's not punctuation in Greek. Uh, they didn't have that. So we have to estimate uh, the emphasis ourselves when we translate it into another language. But I think the NIV got it right. This is important. Now, there is some misunderstanding about this verse. If you're uh, uh, reading this or have read this in the King James Version, I'm talking not about uh, what leads into it. I'm talking about this last part that is highlighted. I'm talking about there will be no more delay. The KJV, based on your texts, actually translates it, there should be time no longer. Well, first, scripture nowhere claims that time will end. There's not a verse in, in the Old or New Testament that says that. God created time, so naturally it must be good. Eternity can be looked at as endless time, the opposite of time ending, but rather endless time of, of the redeemed with their immortal creator and eternal savior, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. But even more importantly, to think that time itself is the focus here, this is the point of this verse entirely. Well, how can we be so confident about that on at least two grounds? First, in key verses that precede this verse 10.6, way back in chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, which we're going to go to in a moment, with the martyrs unto the altar, when they're crying out, how long? This verse is answering that. 
So let's re refresh our memory of those key verses because Revelation continues after chapter six, seven, eight, nine, ten, to address the martyr's plea, right up to ten six. So let's have Gail uh, refresh our memories with chapter six, verse ten and eleven. He cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you so pure judgment for our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? Great. You know what? I think you read this for us the first time. <laughs> I think you did. Okay, uh, let's have you read verse uh, 11 as well. They were told, wait a little longer until the number would be complete, both of their fellow servants and of their brothers and sisters, who were soon to be killed as they themselves had been killed. Wait a okay. little longer. That's right. Wait a little longer. So it's kind of a cryptic message for their direct question, how long, O oh Lord? Wait a little longer. Uh, and hang out, okay? Now we're back in 10.6, and we see he's answering that directly and explicitly so, by saying there's not going to be any more delay. He's taking up the slaughtered saint's cry that this verse and the verses that follow in chapter 10 directly address right up to chapter 11, verse 15, when the seventh angel blows the seventh trumpet. So now let's turn to verse seven to see how this all develops. Uh, and let's have Daniel, if you would, read verse seven for us. Revelations 10, seven. But if the days when the seventh angel, in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Excellent. Now notice we have two things that are highlighted. First, the word, but there will be no more delay. And he's explaining when all this is gonna come down, but in the days when the seventh trumpet blows his trumpet, the mystery that secrets, divine secrets of God will be fulfilled. How? as announced through his prophets. So this verse answers that question of the saints uh, uh, souls under the altar. Here they're assured that their time of waiting will end. When that seventh angel blows that final trumpet, God's will will be fulfilled. Salvation history will come to completion. So this divine mystery has been made known through his prophets. And John himself plays a key role in unveiling that divine plan in the verses that follow. So in essence, verse seven is answering the how long, O Lord, question by stating that there is now to be no more delay before the final period, which ushers in the kingdom. It's the Danielic time, times, and half a time. That is the final period about to begin in the immediate future. So the thrust and force of the future tense here, the mystery of God will be fulfilled. It's the content of the now open scroll of what quote, must soon take place. The very words that were given to John way back in chapter one, verse one. In the last four verses of this chapter and actually well into 11, chapter 11, we're going to see what the ancient prophet Daniel attempted to do, but was told instead to seal up the vision until the proper time. So with what Daniel was commanded not to do, John will do because of his divine commission to prophesy as God's chosen prophet in the last days. So let's have Wendy read verse eight for us, which helps us to clarify all of this. Revelation 10, eight. 
Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. Excellent reading. Now notice I've got take the scroll. This is the same word, uh, biblion, uh, same word used for the scroll that we got earlier when it was first mentioned and back in chapter five. So they're utterly interchangeable. And why I'm, I'm, try, I'm belaboring the point is because commentators go crazy uh, when they don't need to go crazy over uh, synonym variety. For example, in John's gospel, he doesn't always use agape for agape. He'll use the other, wor other words for a love when he's talking about divine love. He's not, he's not slavishly committed to using agape in the way that he means it, where he has to use agape and agape only. Uh, common sense tells you that people like to use variety when they, when they write or speak, and it isn't a change, some dramatic change in meaning uh, or content. And that's the case here with the scroll. So I wanted to get that out of the way. So now we're gonna look at how this plays out from where it all began. It all begins from Paul, uh, Dan, uh, sorry, John springboarding off of an Old Testament prophet. And in this case, it's not Daniel, it's his other favorite. His name is Ezekiel. And you can't give a kind of a endearing name for Ezekiel unless Zeke. you can, Zeke. Zeke maybe, I guess, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's have uh, Rachel uh, read verse 13 for, uh, I'm sorry, for uh, Ezekiel 2 for us. Okay. Um, Ezekiel 2, 8, 10. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. I looked and a hand was stretched out to me and a written scroll was in it. It had writing on the front and on the back. Excellent. Excellent. So see all of these things that happened uh, many centuries ago with Ezekiel, even down to the written scroll having writing on front and back. Now, if you weren't uh, well-versed in first century uh, papology, uh, who would be, pay, uh, papyrus and all that, you wouldn't know that writing on both sides of a scroll was, was a pretty unusual event. You were either dirt poor and couldn't afford another scroll or you were just trying to get that last bit uh, on it and, and not mess with the second scroll. Normally, you wouldn't write on both sides of it. But here, we have it in Ezekiel, and guess what? Didn't we see that back in chapter five? Mm -hmm. and, but, that, but that's not what we're focusing on here. We're focusing on, of course, that this, what's going on in the verse eight is clearly recalling what's going on here in Ezekiel two. And let's go to the next verse in Ezekiel and have Dennis read that, that follows up on uh, the great reading that Rachel gave us. Okay, Ezekiel 3, 3 and 4. Eat this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and in my mouth it was as sweet as honey. He said to me, go to the house of Israel and speak my very words to them. Great. Excellent reading. Now, bear in mind that it's to the house of Israel. There's going to be a number of changes, uh, dramatic changes that John makes uh, after springboarding off this original uh, prophecy and, and the framework and the, and the foundation stuff. It, it's very, very exclusive, the prophecies in the original Ezekiel uh, material, whereas John, we're going to find out, it doesn't say it explicitly in the verses in chapter 10, but we're going to find out later, he's going to be prophesying for the whole, to the whole world. His prophecies are, are meant for all humankind, uh, not just in terms of judgment, but in terms of redemption and conversion, the conversion of the nation motif. Okay, uh, let's now go to verse nine to help uh, bring all of this together. Uh, let's have uh, Edward uh, read again for us, verse nine. Okay, verse 10, uh, nine. So I went to the angel 
and told him, give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will be, bi it will be bitter to your stomach, but sweet is honey in your mouth. Great. Okay, great. Good reading. Uh, what we've got here is the Keats, again, this is, sounds like Ezekiel all over again, but here it's different. Bitter and sweet. In, in Ezekiel, if you recall, it was only sweet. So it fits the pattern in Ezekiel where the scroll both sides, he's given it to eat it, and the point of eating it, of course, for both of us, so that they can prophesy. But here, it's, remember Daniel? Here, it's to prophesy about this now unsealed revelation, the open scroll. Now, as with Ezekiel, eating the scroll, literally eating the divine words, signifies this prophet, like Ezekiel's, empowerment to communicate the mystery of God that will be fulfilled. Ah, let's go to verse 10, and we're going to see some differences. And let's have Ginny uh, read again with verse 10. Revelation 10, 10. So I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Great. All right. So again, we're getting uh, not just the sweet, but the bitter. Hmm, that's interesting. He finds, like Ezekiel, he finds the scroll as he eats it to be sweet. But John's experience is now twofold. It's not just sweet, it's also bitter. You can imagine the conjecture on the meaning and significance of bitter and sweet and what commentators like to do with this, this verse. I mean, it's kind of almost hilarious. Um, I'm not gonna waste your time with lots of rabbit trails that we could run down. Uh, it's probably the most plausible interpretation that its sweetness derives from Revelation's message of salvation offered to all of humankind. But on the other hand, and here's a direct uh, diversion from Ezekiel. It's bitter because God's purposes are going to be accomplished in part through the suffering and faithful witness of his own people, along with to whom? Not just to Israel, ethnic Israel, no, to the whole world. Thus, this change from Ezekiel anticipates that dual character of John's message in the following chapters. So this makes the most sense because in the very next vision, there's pictures of faithful worshipers being besieged and the two witnesses themselves in chapter 10, suffering martyrdom. So God's kingdom will come and as promised, God's people will receive their rewards. Yet, the path of redemption follows the pattern established by Christ, which entails faithful endurance to the end by God's own people. All right, let's have Daniel uh, read again for us the next verse, verse 11, which will conclude our, our chapter 10, believe it or not. Revelations 10, 11. Then they said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Excellent. All right. Now notice that, remember in the Ezekiel passage, it was to Israel. Here, remember at one, two, three, four, peoples, one, nations, two, languages, three, kings, four. Remember the num Jewish numerology for the number four in Revelation? Four symbolizes the people of the world. So his prophecies aren't just for the house of God. They're for everyone. Now, what a, wait a minute. It says you must prophesy again. Hmm. So this is a second commissioning 
to prophesy. Is it not? I believe it is time for Wendy to help clear up what might be uh, some confusion over the first commissioning back there in chapter one. Wendy, would you do the honors? Revelation 1, 9 through 11. I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. Okay, excellent, excellent reading, Wendy. Now, for a very small gold star, why is write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches in red? <laughs> because we ran out of black ink. It's Christ's words. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Rachel's voice. Yeah, so I think somebody oh. just said it though. Um, <laughs> Jesus's voice. Yes, that's right. This is Jesus talking. If you have a red letter edition Bible, this would be in the color of redemptive red. It would not be in black ink. Oh, redemptive okay. red. Redemptive red. <laughs> it's in redemptive red. Now, is this not the first commissioning to prophesy, my friends? It is. It is. And we'll notice, I didn't put, include it, but later, I think it's about verse 19 or so in the same chapter, he says it again, but I, you, get the, you get the idea. Now, back in chapter 10, 11, not 1, 11, but 10, 11, uh, what is going to follow with this second commissioning to prophesy is going to be a summary of that open scroll that John has eaten and is now empowered to prophesy about in his powerful second commissioning. So now it's time for Betty to end this glorious chapter where we've gotten a reprieve of divine wrath. <laughs> and we're gonna have Betty do the honors of reading this review slide. <laughs> okay, sealed seven thunders. Eat the scroll, you must prophesy again. Amen, good job. All right, so those are three to- That's uh, to it. Just, yeah, that's it. Those are three high points of chapter 10. And as we are wont to do with our reviews, let's get some feedback, input, commentary, criticisms, insults, whatever you would prefer at this juncture. <laughs> Chapter 10, what, how did this chapter uh, affect you or what was noteworthy for you in the reading of these verses, these 11 verses of this grand interlude, by the way, that will extend into chapter 11? I thought it was interesting that uh, the angel said there will be no more delay and because I had always been taught what the King James Version said, that there would time would be no more. So that was really interesting. That changes it completely. It does. Yeah. And you can see how it, the reading, the interpretation mm -hmm. of the text has to be about the answer to the martyr's questions back in six, because if you've noticed, notice how an ever increasing explicitness, we're getting answers to how long, O oh Lord? Uh, remember the prayers go up in chapter eight and then the fire, the prayer bomb, fire comes down in the incense of prayer. So it's being answered, but we're still not getting the, the, the direct answer for how long. And here we're getting closer to it by saying, look, I'm going to tell, I'm telling you now that I'm not going to, it's not going to be delayed. It's when that seventh trumpet is blasted that we're going to have uh, this resolution. And we get it in the most uh, surprising way in verse 15 in chapter 11. But we've got to get through the first uh, dozen or more verses in chapter 11 to get there. But he set the tone for it 
here in the interlude that stops and halts and interrupts the ongoing unrepentant judgment cycles that weren't working. And that is exactly why the Seven Thunders judgment cycles were stopped in their tracks because they wouldn't be working either. John, unlike Dan, in Dan, the Daniel passage we read, where it says, wait till the time, seal it up. Sealing it up means it's going to be opened, uh, but not now. Go your way. Go off uh, to Joe's diner and have a, have a meal or two and, and wait. Wait it out. But here, John is told to uh, deep six it, deep six it, because it's not going to work. God's decided that he's moving in a different direction, or he's always been moving in a di different direction. And, and that's how salvation history is going to play out. And so the delay now, we're, we're getting a sharper focus on how that's going to play out. So that's, yeah, that for a lot of people, that verse is, is very critical. Ronnie, do you uh, have a question? Ronnie, you got to unmute it's not, it. It's not really a question. It's just I was just, first of all, the, the foreshadowing is really interesting, but the fact that, I mean, this is a great cliffhanger. It says there will be no delay. And then there's verse after verse after verse. That <laughs> That's so true. That's Where's, so true. I mean, come on, just let it, you know, you just want to just hear it. And so it's, it's not there. So that's, that's how right. I thought it was fun. Yeah, that's so true. There's 12 more chapters. <laughs> You're right. You're right, Bronnie. But uh, seen in the context of, of what we've already had thus far, it is moving us forward. It's really moving us forward. And I'm very excited about when we get into chapter 11 next week, because a lot of, a lot of questions are, and, and confusions are going to be answered there about why this intervention why why delay more judgment to bring uh, usher in the kingdom of God? Uh, and it's a very powerful reason. Uh, so who wants to share? Oh, my wife would like to share and let's have her do such. We don't hear from her much. So when we do hear, it's a good thing. Well, one of the things I really loved was how it started to refer to the glory of God. Mm. And it reminded me of Revelation 4. And I'd like... For you or for you, sweetheart, to read this slide mm. and talk a little bit about that because it reminded me of this. Mm. Sure. You are worthy, our, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now, why that verse is it, it's important in its own right. But the theological and uh, existential uh, significance of it is because it's the finale of the theophany of chapter four. We've been waiting all this time to see why he's worthy and why he's called sovereign, why he's given all these titles and why he's got all of the all of creation praising him. And we find it in, in explicit form here at the end because he is the one and only uncreated creator. And he sustained, and Christ, remember one of those Pauline texts says, he sustains the universe by the power of his word, by the power of his mouth. Yeah. And so it's a powerful truth that, we're, that we have uh, carrying on in this angelic who, a mighty angel who uh, descends from heaven having been and in the presence of this uncreated creator. That's why he has all of these divine like attributes attached to him. He's close to the one. And the other thing that I found really interesting is that it was specifically stated in this chapter mm -hmm. about how God was the one who created all of these things on the earth and the land and the mm -hmm. sea. And it's an echo of his greatness and his glory in the theophany in chapter four. Mm -hmm. And I love just meditating on God's greatness. And that's what this chapter brought back to me. Mm -hmm. Another glimpse of yeah. God's greatness and right. his power and his sovereignty to 
rest and relax in, mm -hmm. in this interlude in between these terrible woes. Yeah, no, good point. Good point. Anybody want to share uh, that hasn't yet? So the, yeah, 10, 10 is definitely reminiscent of uh, the Theophany chapter and the Christology chapter. Uh, God I mean, the Creator I mean, and yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, looking at a uh, nine, because I, I really sat with nine a lot this past week. And uh, at the end of it, you know, it says that they uh, did not repent. And then in, in verse, uh, in verse 20 and then 21, it says they did not repent. So you're thinking, mm -hmm. you know, you're building up this great crescendo of judgment. They didn't repent. They didn't repent. And you're expecting as you go into 10, that it's just going to, okay, we're going to, if we're human beings, we're going to hammer them now. You know, yes. I mean, in our own right. minds, we're going, okay, none of this work with these stinking sinners. Let's just take them down. Let's hammer yeah. them. And then yeah. you get this, I mean, it's like it, it, totally unexpected. Yeah, exactly. In chapter 10, totally unexpected. You get a, a complete shift, like you said, right. of right. color, of, of, uh, of everything else. I mean, there's a softening and a, an exaltation and everything else is happening, like Stephanie just pointing out, you know, that, uh, about that angel. And it just is mind boggling because you're not expecting it at all. I That's mean, right. It's, it's apocalyptic at its finest, I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, no, it's well said. Uh, this my, mighty angel emissary of the creator is reasserting in this chapter, in this vision that John is saying and sharing, it's reasserting the true character of God and his reign, that he's, he's merciful, he's long suffering, he's forgiving, he's doing everything he can to reconcile humankind to himself. How? By reminding readers here that God is the great creator and his exalted son, the great redeemer, is not the destroyer of all things. Remember how we're seeing all this destruction in the judgment cycles? And you might start to think, well, God is the great destroyer. No, he's the opposite of that. So the interlude here in chapter 10, and, we're, and it's going to be on steroids when we get to chapter 11, it redefines the question by the martyrs. How long will God delay in bringing justice? This significant interlude interrupts the impending, increasing wrath unleashed on a defiant world because this interlude shows why God's final judgment seems to be delayed. The judgment cycles of divine wrath alone do not bring repentance. We're going to see in chapter 11, God will use other means, which include the witness of the believing community in the world, dominated by the unbelieving nations, to make that change, that redemptive change that moves salvation history forward. Plan and will, as it says in chapter 10, will be fulfilled. Amen. 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 So Brian, please, please Brian. read chapter 11 for next week. It's very important that we're kind of well versed in it. Read 11. Uh, try to read Kester's little Reader's Digest. Uh, I heard that John is uh, at certain times, hours and days of the week, allowing you to read the commentary. <laughs> <laughs> but, Esther, but you have to make an appointment. Check it out. Right? I have to make an appointment to read two or three pages. Yeah. And then, and then eat. And then, but don't eat the book. Don't eat the script. <laughs> oh. no. yeah. Yeah, don't eat it. I, I want it to be there. So well, I, I, didn't you tell me that you, you saturated it with wormwood? <laughs> Chris. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> Chris. You know how you referred to it being written on papyrus? I know the Dead Sea Scrolls were written on vellum. Was that much later time? I, you know, do no, we have no. fragments of the papyrus that we know it was papyrus? Uh, some of it's papyrus, some of it's vellum. I mean, the Isaiah Scroll is written on copper. They wrote the, the uh, uh, one of the greatest ones in the Dead Sea uh, 
tre uh, treasure trove was made in copper. So vellum, yeah, pap papyrus oh. and vellum were at that time. The codexes, the books came about 50 to 100 years later. Okay. But papyrus and uh, vellum were in that same time period, yeah. Um, but didn't Brownie have a question, comment, or insult? No? no? Okay, she's good. She's good. Okay. I already okay. insulted you. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> she said All right. no. Okay. All right. I think we're at our um, at our time, and we need to uh, to close in prayer. So I think at this time, Don stops recording. <laughs>